For now, let's go ahead and go in the Lord in prayer. We'll go ahead and begin in Judges. God in heaven, thank you for your um, your provisions. As we have people who are in need, who are uh, in pain and suffering, uh, but you know through accidents and uh, just the chaos of this world. Uh, God, you have no intentions for us to go through difficult times, but the difficult times can be used in order to facilitate an understanding of your character and truth. Help us all to continue to focus in on and, and understand your grace, your uh, good intentions towards men. Not blame you for negative situations, but always praise you for what is good. I thank you that we have the opportunity to read and study. We will be able to uh, to hopefully understand you better, to, to comprehend your way, uh, and to be able to portray it to people who are in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So let me go ahead and put this back on here and here. And let's go ahead and, and judges. Remember, Judges, we're looking at the overall theme in Judges chapter 2, which then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord moved, was moved to pity by their groanings because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. But it came about when the judge died that they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers. And following other gods to serve them and bow down to them, they did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. One of the things that I'm looking at, and as I read Judges, and then obviously Ruth is kind of a parenthetical, which we will taught, we will teach. But remember, it, it doesn't really advance the narrative. It kind of allows it to kind of within the time frame of the Judges how the, the line of David got established. Uh, when we get into First Samuel and Second Samuel. I believe that God is establishing with these narratives through Judges, Ruth, and, and the beginning of Samuel that the, the nation of Israel cannot function on their own. They can't do it. They can't function meets tribe being responsible for themselves. And so when they demand a king, God gives them a king. But then what, we, what we're going to see is God holds responsible the nation for the actions of the kings. And so if the king does well, the nation does well. If the king does evil, the nation is punished. Uh, why? Because they have relinquished responsibility for themselves to a federal headship uh, as a humankind. And then God will also, of course, within his plan, provided that final king, which is Jesus Christ, and he will be responsible for that nation when he comes down and reigns for a thousand years in the nation of Israel. In Judges, we were dealing with Gideon, and we're going to go ahead and, and kind of restart Gideon a little bit, make sure we understand what's going on there, um, and uh, grasp the idea of Gideon. Uh, and we started last week. We we're going to review. Over the next three chapters of, of Judges 6, 1 through 8, and I'm going to go ahead and try to get through 8, 21 tonight, we're going to see the history of Gideon. In the next lesson, we'll talk about the aftermath of Gideon and the sin of one of his sons, particularly Abimelech. If you were to represent Gideon with one word at the beginning of the story, what would it be? I, I think the, the, there's enough information to kind of conclude that he was apprehensive at first. Uh, but by the time that the action started going downhill, he had no problem with 300 people chasing down 15,000. Even just thinking about that, it seems ridiculous. And a lot of people call into question the veracity of the story because how does that make any sense? All they had to do is turn around, you know, and just jump on them. You know, it doesn't make any sense. But with God, that's the one thing that people forget, that these are not naturalistic stories or accounts. These are supernatural accounts of God providing the victory. That's the whole point. As the account continues, Gideon is an example of a faithful warrior. At the end of his life, things come into question again, and we'll talk about that, what happens with Gideon at the end. The outline of Gideon, the judge of Israel, is the call of Gideon. Gideon asks for a sign. Uh, Gideon replaces an altar, one that was for Baal, and, um, and replaces it with one for Jehovah. Gideon asked the Lord for another sign, which is kind of where we left off as point number four, and we'll get there. And then Gideon and the 300. And then finally, Ephraim confronts Gideon, and then 
victory over Zeba and Zalmuna. And then after that is where we get into the aftermath of the victory of kicking out the, of the, the Midianites. In Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, the account of Gideon begins with Israel doing evil, idolatry, and immorality. And Yahweh gives. members and brothers and sisters and coming up from the land of Midian and just wiping out basically northern Israel, taking all their crops, taking all their cattle to the point in which we have to make a correction. Last week, I kind of harped on the fact and sometimes when you're reading and you don't, something obvious doesn't seem to hit your brain too well. In Judges chapter 6 verse 2, the power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens. And for some reason, I skipped over the sons of Israel. I looked at it in the Hebrew where I normally do my text, my, my literal Hebrew. And the wordplay is reversed a little bit. And I think I got confused looking at the text itself. But I ignored the structure of what I normally do when I deal with text and ask myself, who's the them? Who, is, who are we talking about? And making sure my interpretation was correct. And so... Midian was not the one in caves and the strongholds. That was Israel. It's a silly mistake. I'm pretty sure most of you are going, yeah, we know, Will. We don't know what you were talking about before. Um, but anyway, so the whole point of the matter is this. Um, it's not a big theological problem for the whole point of the story. However, it is important to get the details correct. What the Bible says is important to relay the truth. So, the reason they built for themselves strongholds, re-looking at this, restudying it, and getting all the details as best I could, was to make sure that they were uh, that they would prevent Midian from being able to steal what they had. Um, the whole point of the matter I was trying to make last time was is that Gideon's actions was to provoke Midian to war, and probably to also provoke Israel to war as well, which that still stands true. Um, but Midian was not kind of like putting themselves in stronghold so that Israel could not fight back. It was the, actually the other way around. All right. Judges 6, 7 through 35. The Lord commanded Gideon to tear down the altar to Baal, the Asherah, and replace it with an altar to the Lord. Again, this was to provoke the Midianites. But it was also to provide an opportunity for Israel to be challenged and force them to fight as well. It's a it's. Um, it's it, it's an important distinction to make that the judge throughout the book of Judges oftentimes became the catalyst for the entire nation to go to war. They are oppressed. They're calling out. They're defeated. They have obviously um, have lacked uh, opportunities for training, food, provisions, and so they become weak, and they need to have somebody they can rally behind and have supernatural powers to be able to actually go out and fight. So Gideon sounds the battle cry, calls his family, the Abizarites, and he sent a call for troops from Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, all of which provide troops to come and fight. Now that brings us to Judges 6, 36-40. When he sounded that alarm, he received uh, 35... Um, 35,000, yeah, the 33, 30, uh, 32,000 men to battle. And then we have the sign of the fleece. And I, I want to reiterate this a little bit, all right? There's a typical response to reading the judges is to analyze the judge, right? And, and I, I think that's accurate. We should do that. We're not going to dismiss that at all. So we oftentimes want to look at this in question Gideon's actions, his responses, what he does, and the fact that he calls for a sign um, and, and asks the question, why? But the real star in, this, in the whole entire book of Judges, just like it was in Joshua, just like it was in the Torah, is not the people. The people are individuals who the only thing they are famous for, according to Hebrews chapter 11, is their faith. The reason they're able to prevail is because they believed in Yahweh, Jehovah God. So Gideon plays the background. Even though he is the main character, we need to make sure that we keep our focus upon who God is and what he does. 
who is Gideon that he should be anybody in the story? He calls himself, I'm, I am the, I'm the youngest of my family. I am the weakest of the tribes of Manasseh. Why am I being picked? Exactly. That's the point. So everything that Gideon does is because he has become convinced and persuaded by God to go out there and you can do it. And so he can do it. So keep the focus on Jehovah and throughout the texts. Now, it does come up to the question, though, once again, to be able to understand this particular text and ask some questions about what exactly is happening here. And I have um, some observations along with the actual um, what's actually going on. So let's go ahead and read this real quick. Judges chapter 6, 36. Then Gideon said to God, if you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken, behold, I will put a fleece on the wool on the threshing floor. Now, quickly, a threshing floor, it's not like if they have a barn, okay? A threshing floor is usually a large flat rock because you can't beat out wheat over soil. Um, it doesn't work that way. And so they have a, a large, flat, hard surface to be able to threshing floor. So don't think of it as like a barn area. If there is dew on the fleece only and it's dry on the ground, then I will show, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken. And it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he drained the, the dew in from the fleece, a bowl full of water. I don't know why he does the bowl full of water thing. You know, if I go, if I had this kind of test out there and I walked up and the entirely dry, all I would have to do is feel the fleece and go, hey, that's wet. Why am I going to wring out this fleece to find out how much water is in it? And I don't have an answer for you. I just find that curious. Then Gideon said to God, do not let your anger burn against me that I may speak once more. Please let me make, make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece and let there be dew all around the ground. God did so that night for it was dry only on the fleece and dew was on the ground. Now, I'm not going to show the video, but one of the funniest moments in that video, uh, I don't want to say the video, the girls made a video when they were in high school. Um, Serenity wanted to put together a little production about Gideon. She thought this was absolutely hilarious. Okay. And so was it you, Leanna, that was God? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she's in this big beard and she has a squirt, a little spray bottle and has a fleece there and she's spraying the fleece. <laughs> it's one of the most vivid memories I have of that video. It's absolutely hilarious. But it's, it's kind of like, you know, it, you put that kind of imagery to, to mind. You're going, it's kind of it's kind of funny when you think about it. That This is the situation. This is your test, a fleece. Now, I will say this in... Um, in speaking out against people who use this in application for oneself. Have you ever heard somebody say, hey, if you don't know what to do, put out a fleece. Either metaphorically or literally, you know, to test, find out, God, God, what do you want me to do? And if you want me to move to Kansas City, you know, give me a bonus this year for my job. And if I don't get a bonus, then I will not go. And they use that as a sign from God. And oftentimes it's self-fulfilling uh, prophecies, right? I want to be somewhere. And so therefore I kind of make it happen and claim that God's actually the one behind it. And when it fails, then you go, why, God, did you bring me here? I've actually had conversations with people when, uh, when I first moved here. One woman was basically going, I don't know why God brought me here. And of course, you remember my response. God didn't bring you here. You packed up your moving van. You drove out here and you moved here. If God brought you here, you'd have... Been, been zoomed here by a whirlwind. That's God moving you here, okay? You've been the whole Dorothy thing, but don't blame God for the decisions you make. And, the, and, and taking this type of information and trying to put this into application is very dangerous, obviously, and, you, and people get misled um, and even mistaught about how we should interact with God. Um, in fact, um, do we ever see this repeated? Is there any place where where a fleece is put out and this kind of test is, is played out there. No, it's not. So I don't know why people think they should do that now in their own lives. So generally speaking, why do people ask for signs? You go through the Bible and there are signs requested and granted. Why? Um, and it's a question of motives. And, then again, and I don't like to do this because, you know, I think there's things behind the story that we're not privy to. We're given an account of information, and I don't like to cast 
doubt upon a person's motivation unless it's specifically stated. So generally speaking, the reason to ask for a sign is to relieve apprehension. I, I, I'm, I'm hesitating. I, I don't know if I should do it. And so God gives a sign to demonstrate that they, they should be comfortable doing something. To release fear, doubt, or to demonstrate the veracity of a personal instruction. In fact, um, look at, and I'm going to deal this, deal this in, a, in, a, in a concept of a theological impact. Um, look at the signs. In Judges chapter 6, verse 20 to 24, there is a sign given. Why is it given? You can go back to chapter 6, verse 17, to find out the reason why it is given. So Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. Now, the, the angel of the Lord came and said, the Lord be with you. And he said, um, how do I know? And he goes, but the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. So if a person is standing before you saying the Lord is with you, surely I will be with you. That person is claiming to be something. Now, I don't know how the person appeared to Gideon. Did he, was he all shiny? Was he looking like a regular man? But the angel of the Lord, who is the Lord, claims, I will be with you as you fight with Gideon. Obviously, a claim is made, and Gideon's probably going, all right, let me put this test. I know the stories of old. I'm going to go ahead and ask you for a sign. I'm going to go ahead and prepare an offering for you. And look what God does. In verse 20, the angel of God said to him, take the meat, the unleavened bread, and lay it on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that it was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, how did he know it was the angel of the Lord? He requested a sign. It was granted. That was basically designed to show the veracity of a person or instruction. The next um, sign, and I'm going to go ahead and just put these two up here, the dream of the interpretation. Let's go ahead and, and skip the fleece for a moment and go to the dream and the interpretation. Um, here we have a sign given to Gideon by God without Gideon asking for one, but God anticipates or actually knows exactly what's happening within Gideon. So, um, I, of course, I'm kind of skipping around here a little bit, but I do want to read this particular section here. Verse 9 says, Now at the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against camp, for I have given into your hands 300 versus, you know, about 130,000 people. What would, you be, what would your response be? Right. <laughs> you, get, you dwindle your trips down to 300 people, God says, okay, go get them. Do you see what I'm looking at? I mean, how in the world is this going to take place? But verse 10, but if you are afraid to go down, meaning what? If he's afraid to go down. Why? It's 300 versus 130,000. Odds don't stack up well. If you're afraid to go down, uh, go with Purah, your servant, and go to the camp. And you will hear what they say. And afterward, your hand will be strengthened that you may go down against the camp. So he went with Purah, his servant, down to the outpost of the, of the army that was in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Amphalites and all the sons of the east, that's a lot of people, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts and their camels were without number, as numerous as the sand of the seashore. When Gideon came, behold, a man was, rela was relating a dream to his friend. And he said, behold... Do people talk like this, by the way? I, I always want to talk like this. I just want to come up to Dan one day and go, Behold, I have a thought. And Dan's going to go, What? And I'm just going to be very, like, you know, not taken seriously at all. Behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian, and it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that it lay, the tent lay flat. And his friend replied, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. Hmm. 
first of all, um, the interpretation makes no sense to me. And that's not the point. Did God give them this dream? Doesn't say that. Does God empower the friend to have supernatural ability to interpret the dream? That's not the point either. The point is this. They're scared. He, Gideon understands that God has dealt with the people and they're afraid. And there's no logical reason for them to be afraid other than God is causing them to be afraid. God is fighting for them. When, they, when Gideon hears this, what does it say? And its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He's giving God the glory and God the honor and the understanding that God is the one fighting for them. It's already won. And he returned to the camp of Israel, saying, Arise, camp of Israel, and it arise for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. So here, the reason why he needed to have a sign was to, to alleviate fear. Chapter 6, 36, going back to the fleece. Why was this sign given? Why did he ask for it? We read it. I believe the answer is simply in verse 36. Gideon said, if you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken. He is asking for verification. Now, he asked for verification twice. And I think it's normal for us to say, Gideon's scared now. Um, I have a, and it's not, it, it, it talks in the first person, so it's a little bit of a stretch, I'll be honest with you, okay? But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking perhaps... Perhaps his leadership is in question from all the tri all the different tribes and the 32,000 people. Who are you, Gideon? Why do you think you should lead us? He is the youngest of his family, the smallest uh, faction of the tribe of Manasseh. Why is he leading? And it doesn't say it, but I think he is actually pro providing verification. It's one of the reasons why I think that he drained the water into the bowl. Demonstrating that this was not simply just some type of happenstance. Now, it's a theory, I can't prove it, but neither does it say that he was afraid. When did he become afraid? When the 32,000 became 300. That's when he became afraid. So, again, it's uh, people argue over this. I don't think it's really necessary to argue. People think he's apprehensive. Sure, I, I, obviously, I think there's uh, some supernatural things going on and he's d dealing with them. But all of a sudden to be told after... Uh, doing the altar of Baal and having everybody upset with him to call for people and 32,000 people come down and now go and fight and still the numbers are four to one. Now, if God's fighting for you, all you need is one, right? But at the same time, look at it from a realistic standpoint. How would you respond to this situation? And I really don't want to put any uh, un undue blame upon uh, Gideon. That's not necessary. Now, Dealing with this and looking at the entire situation with Gideon, looking at the three different signs, what does this tell us about God? What one characteristic or what one attribute can we say about God in dealing with Gideon? No matter what reason, no matter what um, was Gideon's problem, no matter what motivated him to ask for these signs, we can understand that God is demonstrating his grace. Gideon should know the Torah. Gideon should know Joshua. He's already been told all of the miracles as they came out of Egypt. He knows them. And he should react to the godly standard of Yahweh without being told. David is a perfect example of that. Israel is cowering behind, the, behind their lines when Goliath comes out and challenges them, they're all cowering, they're hiding. David comes out and he, he, does he need to be told by God, hey, go kill that guy? He doesn't say that. David shows up and goes, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I still want to know how he knows that. Um, but he says, somebody to take care of that. 
And if you're not going to do it, I will. See, that's the, that's the difference. That's the idea behind here. Gideon should already have this courage. Israel should already have this courage. You should not need God to, to kind of demonstrate it for you. However, God still provides it. God also knows the tendency of mankind, and he still perpetually provides evidence needed to establish the veracity of the calling and removing the fear of those who God chooses to demonstrate God's power. So God's choosing Gideon to go and demonstrate his power. And so therefore, he's going to provide to Gideon everything that Gideon needs to be able to do it. This is also demonstrated as Israel came out of Egypt. How many plagues did they see? They saw the water being parted. They, they understood that they had all the provisions. And yet, when they came to Kadesh Barnea, what happened? Uh, it's, it's one of the greatest mysteries I, I ever think of. I, I, w I would hope that I would see that if I came out of Egypt and I went to Kadesh and go, yeah, it's a big army. Yeah, there's some big people there. But did you just see what God did coming over here? This should be easy, and yet they don't. God provides perpetual evidences. And so now, for us, theological impact for the church. We've seen all the signs from Genesis all the way through the church age into the, the, the prophecies of Revelation, including the minor prophets. We should not need a sign. We should not need to say, God, please help me understand. Give me a sign. And I have to say, in my own shame, I've asked for signs before. And I remember, I'll relate a personal story. All right. Sarah and I were on the rocks. We weren't engaged yet. We you know, weren't married yet. We were dating. Um, and she was dissing me pretty hard. And I went outside, tears in my eyes, going, God, should I break up with her? Should I move on and look for a different one? I believe that she was the one, you know. And, and so I looked up in the sky and, and asked God for a sign. There was a tree. There, there's a whole bunch of trees. And one branch waved like this in the wind. I go, okay. <laughs> I did that. Silly of me. I actually relayed this to Sarah. And, you know, and, and she's like, well, I don't know if that's a sign or not. I go, well, I think it is. And I, we had this conversation. It's kind of, and, and it was silly, but this is the type of things that we think of, right? In our in our lack of maturity, our lack of spiritual understanding, we make silly claims like this. And we need to be able to understand that God, through His Word, has given us everything for life and for godliness. Therefore, make positive choices. Make good choices understand um, his will and his nature. We don't take this kind of action for our own selves. Let's move on. Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. So they have 32,000 men. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all his people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod, and the camp of Midian was on the north side of them in the hill of Morah uh, in the valley. Okay, they're getting prepared for war. Gideon's pretty excited about this. He's already had the fleece, right? He's always said, this is happening. We're going to do this. And look at the people behind me. We're doing great. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many. I'm pretty sure Gideon's going, what? <laughs> Again, is it conjecture? Absolutely. I don't know what is Gideon's mind. I know how I would respond to that. I have an army, I have God's word, and now I'm being told I have too many. It's too many for me to give you the Midian in your hands, for Israel would become boastful. See, does he say they might become boastful? He knows the hearts, he knows the minds, and he wants to ensure, and he's going to do it provisionally, right? He wants to ensure that Israel takes no pride in itself in the battle. Israel become boastful, saying, by my own power has delivered me. They'll go, wow, look at me. We are strong, 32,000. We can defeat anybody, and we have the strength to do this. God's saying it's not about you. 
Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever's afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned. Immediately, they lost a third of their people. They're down to 10,000. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you. Gideon's not responsible for choosing, the th choosing how many people or who is going to fight. I am going to do this for you. I'm going to give you what to look for. This will be, this one shall go with you. He shall go with you, but every one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, you shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now, normally I stop here and get a picture in my head. And again, I pictured the video that my girls did. Serenity, with dopey eyes on, has a cup of water and, and, and is lapping with her tongue. You know, and I'm going, humans can't do that, right? And so normally what's thought is this. The 300 men are stupid because no one can drink like a dog. That's not what's happening here, okay? Read verse 6 and put it in context. Now, the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. There's a lot of different ideas of what's happening here, okay? Um, so here is actually what's occurring, all right? The lapping is in reference to the fact that you're not going down and putting your mouth in the water like a like a camel, like a giraffe, all right? It is individual who's going down, and the lapping refers to the procedure of actually bringing it up to your mouth. So it's not using it like a like that's how a dog would drink. They, they go down the water. They don't go all the way down and slurp. They bring the water up to their mouth with their tongue. Humans can't do that. They can't cup their tongue well. And so they're using their hand. That's what it says. Who brought their hand to their mouth. That's the point. Now, a lot of people go, oh, these were the smart ones. These are the ones that were aware. These are the ones that are battle ready. They're, they're, they're aware of their surroundings and they're drinking water with their hand, but they still are standing up and they're not going all the way down to the water with their mouth being unaware. These are more battle ready people. Does it say that? It doesn't say that. It's just the way God chose them. Now, why? And you know, I, I don't, I don't know. Did God put it in their mind on how to drink water? It doesn't say that. I'm just, it's just how it, it just reads on what it says. This is what it says. It only accounts for what happens. It doesn't say the why. But it's not a matter of the of the of the morons versus the smart ones. It's not a matter of who's our battle ready. It's simply a way of dividing it down to get down to a number that God's going, you know what? Now I can go ahead and function. Now I will be glorified. Now when the story is retold, 300 versus, you know, 130,000, 135,000 people, that's a story to be retold. And nothing less than miraculous. Nothing less than supernatural. Nothing less than God getting the glory. Those 300 men were there to witness it. What did they really do? I, I, I don't know. The battle is not really told as far as what the Israelites did, except for they made a bunch of noise. What does it remind you of? My first one reminds me of Jericho. You know what? You're going to get this victory. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to walk around the city seven times for seven days and then walk around the seventh day for seven times. And then the walls are going to fall down. You don't have to try to, to siege them out. I'm going to give you the victory. And um, who gets the glory for that? You see, that's, that's the point. God gets the glory. And, and in Judges 7, 16 to 25, Gideon tells the people the battle plan. And again, I already kind of record it. 
Um, and now again, does God tell Gideon what the battle plan is? I would say probably, but it's not recorded. There's no there's no recording here that, that God tells Gideon what the battle plan is. He just says, uh, get them ready. The plan is this. They're going to make a bunch of noise in the middle of the night. That's it. Uh, look at verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him at the camp, at the outskirts of the camp, at the beginning of the middle of the watch, when they had just posted the watch, they blew the trumpets and smashed the pitchers that were in their hands. Again, 300 people, or actually 100 people, then it kind of got echoed throughout all the, around the uh, hillsides because he broke them up into three camps, 100 people per camp. So when the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held the torches in their left hands and their trumpets in their right hands blowing. Where's their swords? Still on their hips. They don't have any weapons, right? <clears throat> and they yelled a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each stood in his place around the camp. They didn't run down there. And all the army ran, crying out as they fled. So the, the Midianite army just cried. And when, the, and when they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set the sword of one against the other, even throughout the whole army. And the army fled as far as Beth, Shittah, which is Zerah, as far as the edge of Abel Mola by Tabith. So what happened? They blew their horns, smashed their jars, held torches, screamed, yelled, did whatever they can, and the army killed themselves. The confusion, the fear, either supernatural fear, whatever it may be, they all just started swinging their swords. I have a movie reference in mind blind swordsman just hacking away at a tree, you know, just I have no idea what I'm fighting. And that's basically what happens here. They have no idea what's happening and they're scared to death. So they just start killing one another. They don't know who they're fighting. So Gideon tells the people the battle plan, make a bunch of noise in the middle of the night, and then Ephraim gets the mop-up duty. Look at verse 24. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hillside of Ephraim saying, come down against Midian and take the waters before them as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were summoned and they took the waters. So basically they guarded the water so they couldn't cross. And when they came up, the men captured the two leaders of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, great names. And they killed Oreb by the rock of Oreb. And they killed Zeb at the wine press of Zeb. What is great names? And they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon from across the Jordan. So, um, what do we have here? Obviously, it's a supernatural victory, and it's something that, they, that doesn't really get emphasized enough. It's a great story. People are like, oh, great battle plan. And no, I'm sorry. Normally, if you go ahead and do this against 124,000, 150,000, whatever it may be, um, I, I, the numbers are escaping right now. So the 120,000 dead and 15,000 survived. How, making a bunch of noise is not going to do that typically. Okay. There's something supernatural going on. So after Ephraim cleans up, mops up and kind of chases down and kills these two Kings, then something strange happens. It happens in, in Judges 8, 1 through 3. Then the men of Ephraim said to him, What is this that you have done to us, not calling us when you went to fight against Midian? And they contended with him vigorously. Kind of a strange contest, isn't this? But he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is this not gleaning the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? Basically, isn't your throwaway grapes better than my grapes? The vintage ones? Kind of strange way to say it. I'm going to explain this in just a moment. God has given the leaders of Midian and Oreb and Zeb into your hands. What was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. So Ephraim contends with Gideon. And it's rather interesting. It is believed at this time, and I'm kind of in agreement with this, based upon the history so far, that Ephraim is very, very strong. Why they did not defend their brothers or rally their troops under them beforehand is believed it was thought that these people need to take responsibility for themselves. Manasseh and Zebulun and Naphtali all have to kind of rally together first 
every I'm trying to go ahead and help them out without invitation or without them working is not really within their responsibility. However, because Ephraim was so strong, it is uh, it appears as though they ha they think that there is their responsibility to fight and they want to fight invaders when people are going to fight. So Ephraim was indeed willing, but the tribes under oppression must, must initiate the battle through first covenant keeping. Um, it is believed that Ephraim was still very strong and keeping the covenant. They're not the ones invaded. They're not the ones in trouble. But they want to be part of the battles because they believe that they are strong and are the protectors of Israel in the situation. So um, now that's presumption. We don't find out why Ephraim was upset. The only two reasons that I could think of that Ephraim would be upset is that, number one, they were the de facto protectors of Israel and should be consulted. Or the battle took place pretty close to their border. So Ephraim's like, hey, you're doing battle, which caused them to kind of flee through our territory. And then you call ahead of us and make sure that we go ahead and defeat them, which we have no problem doing. But you should have warned us. So what does Gideon do? Gideon begins a very diplomatic response. What he is saying here is that, and again, through the grape situation, okay, all he is saying is you're much better than I am. You're stronger than I am. You're, you're so much better than I am. Um, what do we have here? This is some, some really serious sucking up here, <laughs> right? He's trying to actually um, calm their anger because Ephraim is the strongest, probably the strongest camp at the time. Maybe Judah's a little bit stronger, but they're still even farther south. So um, he's doing some diplomatic work here and basically says, what you did in defeating Midian and killing these two kings was more than what I did. He might be even showed him sword. See, I didn't even get my sword wet yet. All I did was chase him. And I called ahead for you to go ahead and, and, and get, uh, get ahead of them. So the battle took place. Uh, Ephraim played a significant part according to what Gideon says, and that the ultimate success actually lies in the hands of Ephraim because they killed two of the kings, Oreb and Zeb. And so what does it say? Their anger towards him subsided when he said that. Then in Judges 8, 4 through 12, we see the pursuing of the 300. Um, I find this kind of strange that we don't call more people. The 300 go and chase. Then Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to the Jordan and crossed over, weary yet pursuing. Now, again, something unusual happens. This is the disarray that is happening within Israel and within the tribes. Okay? So they're pursuing Midian. They're weary yet pursuing. And so he came to Succoth or Succoth. If you want to get a little bit more accurate. Um, and, he, and he says to the people there, please give loaves of bread to the people who are following me. Evidently, Gideon's ahead of them. For they are weary, and I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. So two more kings. The leaders of Succoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hands that we should give bread to your army? In other words, hey, um, we don't want to cause any trouble. We want to take sides. We'll see who wins first. Gideon said, all right. <laughs> I love the translation. All right. When the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hands, then I will thrash your bodies with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. In other words, you don't want to help? That's fine. When I'm done, I'm coming back for you. To which they're sure they scoffed. And what? And he went up from there to Penuel and spoke similarly to them. But the men of Penuel answered him just as the men of Succoth had answered. So he said also to the men of Penuel, saying, when I return safely, I will tear down this tower. Evidently, they had a watchtower of some kind, maybe one of their edifices that were uh, very, um, very staunch in their area. So provisions requested and denied to Succoth and Penuel. Then there's a little bit of deviation, goes back to the pursuit in verses 10. Now, um, the 300 were chasing 15,000 men, and there are already 220,000 swordsmen that have died. And they chased them. Um, again, I don't care how many people you've lost. 
15,000 versus 300 is not a fair fight. What's the difference? The difference is not numbers. The difference isn't about how mighty the men are. The difference is they have God fighting for them, and the people of Midian knew it. They didn't want anything to do with it. They already knew something supernatural occurred, and they knew they could not win, and so they fled. Gideon went up by the way to those who lived in tents east of Naba and, and Jagba and attacked the camp when the camp was unsuspecting. When Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them to the captured two kings of, of Midian, and they were routed the whole army. They killed 15,000 men with 300. It's amazing how fear does take over a person when it comes down to army. It doesn't matter how well trained you are. If you're scared, you can't fight. After they, after they recaptured the two kings, routed the army, evidently they brought the kings back with them because it takes a little segue back. When Gideon was heading back towards Israel, he went back to Succoth and went back to Penuel, and he did just that. He killed the men of the cities, of both cities, and tore down the tower. <clears throat> so the revenge upon Succoth and Penuel, <clears throat> why is this written? Why is this here? Why did Gideon do this? Um... Israel's in disarray. The tribes are fighting amongst themselves. They don't support one another. Obviously, I, I still don't understand why Reuben and Gad aren't even mentioned as far as being part of the forces. They just, Midian just walked right through their land, crossed the Jordan, and went into northern Israel without any e evidence that there's even a finger raised up against them. They get in their strongholds, they put in their cities, and they just go ahead and say, yeah, go ahead and pass through. They don't fight for them either. And so this is put up there as a judge of Israel, demonstrating to all the tribes, don't mess with the judge. I believe this is recorded here specifically for future references and how all of Israel needs to be unified in fighting against their enemies. And they were not. In chapter 8, verses 18 through 21, Gideon finishes the job. Then he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, what kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? And they said, they were like you, each one resembling the son of a king. In other words, ah, and they're flattering Gideon here, right? Ah, oh, you know, strong man like you. And he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother, and the Lord lives. If they, in other words, they look like me. You killed my family. If you had not killed them, I would let you live. I would not kill you. So he said to Jether, this firstborn rise, kill them. But the youth did not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. Now, why would Gideon say this? Um, to be killed by someone inferior, right? Not your better, but your inferior was the ultimate shame. And so the, the two kings of Midian says, do it yourself. In other words, give us the honor of being killed by somebody mightier than us. Rise for yourself and fall on us, for as the man, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed them, and took the crescent ornaments which were on the camel's necks. I've, I think you've heard me say several times um, that um, the, the, crescent, the crescents is a picture of the moon god, which is a picture of Baal. Okay? Um, there's a lot to be said about this. I'll just kind of briefly sum it up. The moon god, Baal, is throughout the Old Testament. Now, is he called Allah? Is this, is this, um, is this moon god and, ba and Baal worship the same as Islam? No, it's different. When the Arabs were uh, prominent in about between, you know, the, about 200, 300, 400 BC, uh, AD, 300, 400 AD, they were polytheists. They were uh, not, not, not full pantheists, but they had a god for everything. In order to be able to unite the Arabs against the Jews and Christians, Muhammad went into his tent and looked at all the different gods and picked one and said, this will be our monotheistic god. 
This will be the God above all gods. And he used that God as a battle cry and basically to unify all the Arabs around the area to fight against the Jews and the Christians. That God was Baal. I believe that 100%. It was the moon God. And so that, and so that is why the consistency. This is, I, I don't know if it's um, supernaturally influenced. It's, or is it, I don't believe in coincidences. But the main God that always fights against Jehovah God, the true God, seems to be this moon God. But all worship, I believe, is similar to, if not likened to, Islamic worship today. And that, to me, is um, still amazing. That who God fights against is becomes very consistent throughout all the history of Israel. And all the Israel's enemies. It's one of the reasons why I don't think Europe is the main focal point of the of the beast and the end time situation. I do believe it is Middle East because if you read the Minor Prophets, who is God fighting against? When the Messiah comes back, who does he fight against? Egypt, Jordan, Edom, you know, the northern armies, which I believe is more Turkey than Russia. That makes any sense. But it's all the armies, all the nations surrounding Israel. Where's Spain? Where's Italy? Where's Germany? You know, we don't have those 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 uh, nations are not mentioned. It's all about the surrounding nations around Israel, and that's who he does battle with because the main contention is over which God. And the God that they're fighting against perpetually is Baal. Theologically, how do we take this passage? Dealing with, dealing with Gideon and all he does. I think it has to go back to chapter 6, verse 13. Gideon makes a request. Gideon makes an observation. First, in, ver in verse 12, the angel of the Lord comes and says, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior, or mighty man of valor. What is it? Yeah. I can't remember the King James Version. Yeah, you swaggy man of valor. <laughs> and Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord, if, if Jehovah is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are all his miracles, which our fathers told about us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? He was looking for miraculous victory. If the Lord is with us, we should be able to see it. We should see the miracles of God doing miraculous things in Israel to protect us from our enemies. All of these things. Everything that God did for him, the signs that he did, the battle, the 300, the 120,000 people killing themselves, the, the, the 300 finishing the job of 15,000, all of it is simply to perform to, to God to fulfill the, Gideon's request to make sure everyone understood that the battles of Gideon were supernatural. If get God gets the glory which I think is probably one of the most important lessons we can learn as believers is that regardless of whatever happens in this life, no matter what we see or experience, God gets the glory. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for you demonstrating your power, your will, your miraculous achievements through the hand of Gideon. Thank you for the story and preserving it for us. Help us to not try to duplicate what Gideon's done. Help us not try to, to react as Gideon did, but help us to be able to understand your power and your influence that we may be able to give you the glory in anything. Understanding your good intentions, your goodwill, your gospel, so as not to fret or despair, to help us to be able to get through any circumstance because of who you are, and have eternal perspectives because of the promises made to us. Thank you. We praise you. You are our God, our Savior, our provider. And help us to always think of you in everything we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.